Well, it's hard to believe that it's been 25 years. And actually, um, I started teaching classes and experimenting with this when I first moved to New York in 76, so that's even longer. But it's been an official school and a business since 87. I, I'm going to uh, read my introduction, and then Monica, my wife Monica Banks will introduce um, the two wonderful women who um, have started this all great, awesome organization. My idea about teaching now over 25 years is a personal and persistent concoction of elements designed to help people overcome their fears in order to express themselves with greater fluency and freedom. When Catherine Shimoni told me about Global Goods Partners at a dinner last summer at Jill Belofsky's house, I knew immediately that celebrating her organization was how I wanted to mark the 25th anniversary of the Writer's Studio. The similarity between our missions goes back to my mother's story. In order to help support her family, my mother was made to leave school in the 10th grade. Three of her teachers and an administrative assistant thought enough of her abilities to brave a Rochester, New York snowstorm in an attempt to convince her orthodox father to let her continue her studies. This story has various versions and tellers. One version makes it a caravan of teachers and turns what must have been an assistant administrator into a deputy mayor, even though there is no mayor in Rochester. The truth, however, is powerful enough. My grandfather's belief that educating girls was a waste of time wasn't uncommon then, and unfortunately in some parts of the world even now. Born and raised in the same house, I attended the same high school and knew intimately every inch of that walk through deep snow and can only imagine how determined and devoted these teachers were to attempt such a thing. My mother wasn't the only good female student forced to leave school to help support her family. Family pride was represented by sons, not daughters. My mother's younger brother, Meyer, won a full scholarship to Cornell University, and though he wasn't exactly encouraged by his father, no one stood in his way. My mother told me this story when I was struggling in school and considered dropping out. Speaking in a voice loud enough to be heard by our Irish and German neighbors, she told me, finish school or I'll kill you. <laughs> Do it for me, not you. You want to end up like me? Except for the years when I was small and she helped my father in his various businesses, she worked as a filing clerk, filling other people's more important papers. Her pension was $51.37 a month. And this was Rochester, New York in the 50s, not Afghanistan during endless upheaval. She could work outside her home and show her face in public. The fact that this isn't an uncommon story makes it all the more special. An organization like Global Good Partners deserves, serves a good beyond perhaps what even their creators, Catherine Shimoni and Joan Schifrin, can know. It's only right that we thank them tonight, and Jill Belofsky for editing the letters you'll soon hear. <clears throat> Before introducing them, I want to introduce my wife, Monica Banks, another remarkable woman, who took a small school uh, of 60 students and turned it into what it is today. Monica. Well, for 17 years, I've come to these readings and sat next to Phil and been so grateful I didn't have to get up on stage. <laughs> so, thank you for coming. It's a really great joy for me to come to these readings and where I get to see the many people I deal with by email throughout the year, some directly and mostly through Liz and others. Many of you may know me as Gus Benya. That is my email persona. <laughs> I've been part of the writer's studio for 17 years, and during that time, Phil and I have enjoyed, sometimes with astonishment, the growth of the school. Its care and feeding have been a joy and sometimes a puzzle, and at a moment like this, it's hard not to believe we did more than a few things right. Developing a method for teaching literary writing to adults is a pretty amazing feat. 
but I really believe that it's the teachers and staff who built this school and work at it every day that make it the unique community it has grown to be. Where we now teach writers on every continent via our online classes, and where we now have branches in Tucson, San Francisco, and Amsterdam, and where we have adapted our method to work with high school students and now high school students with learning disabilities. So I am here to thank all the dedicated and resourceful teachers and staff who have helped build the Writer Studio over the past 25 years. And I'd like to name just a few key administrators who keep things running smoothly and growing stronger every day. And if you want to stand up, and that would be good. Um, Leslie Dorman, Associate Director. <laughs> Cynthia Weiner, Assistant Director. <laughs> and Lucinda Holt, Director of the Online Program and Tech Support. <laughs> And Rebecca G., who runs our nonprofit Kids Write program. And Lisa Bellamy, who cultivates the poetry program. And Eleanor Kedney, who's the director of branches but isn't here. She's home in Tucson teaching her students. And Isabel DeConink. Director of Press and Marketing, who puts together these amazing readings and who found us this amazing venue, which everyone is just in love with. <laughs> and the tireless and unflappable Liz Kingsley, Administrative Director. Are you here? And now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Global Goods Partnership. Global Goods is a nonprofit organization that creates economic opportunity for women in some of the world's poorest communities by providing access to the US market for the fair trade handmade I'm sorry, for the fair trade handmade products they produce. Working in partnership with women led producer groups with strong social missions, GGP provides technical assistance product development, operations expertise, and targeted capacity building grants to their community-based partners. With this support, Global Goods Partners is empowering women to create sustainable change. Joan Schifrin, along with Catherine Shimoni, launched GGP after a 20-year career directing international and social, social marketing campaigns with the private and nonprofit sector. It is my honor to introduce to you Joan Schifrin. Um, um, Global Goods is really honored to be part of the Writers um, Studio 25th anniversary celebration. While the missions of our two organizations are distinct, we feel a great kinship with the Writers Studio. Um, by way of background, and just to summarize what um, Monica briefly talked about, um, Global Goods Partners, again, is a nonprofit that creates economic opportunity for women um, in communities around the world um, and provides access to the U.S. market for the fair trade handmade products that they produce. We work with about 40 different social enterprises worldwide that integrate their commitment to community development, such as improvements in education, health, women's rights and employment opportunities with income generating programs and craft development. In fact, many of the women we work with are earning incomes for the first time in their lives and they're able to pay for things their families desperately need but couldn't afford before, such as more nutritious food, school fees for their children and health care. Most of the communities in which we work are marginalized, poor, and seeped in tradition. The same community that passes on beautiful age-old craft techniques can be especially hostile to women. The letters you're about to hear are from women artisans whose voices, singularly and as a group, are rarely heard. Tonight's event set us on a course that began several months ago of interviewing women artisans and capturing their stories of hardship, love, poverty, and personal achievement. 
Tonight, as, and as we move forward as an organization, we will continue to share the stories of women artisans, helping to raise their voices and raise awareness of the contributions they're making to their families and communities, despite the great obstacles that they face. Thank you, and good evening. Um, I'm from Afghanistan. And unfortunately, there is no good news about my country in the news that we hear today. But tonight, I want to share with you a story of a partnership of success. And that partnership, as you've just heard, is that of Kandahar Treasure and Global Good Partners. I'm going to reemphasize and state that we are, Kandahar Treasure is the first historical business owned and operated by women. So we are making history as we work. We have over 370 women working both from their homes as well as coming to a production site located in Kandahar City where women are producing fine hand embroidered products that are now marketed both inside Afghanistan as well as internationally and we have products uh, with us tonight as well. So we're, the, the practical benefit to these women is, of course, the finances. That is changing lives for extremely poor uh, women throughout Kandahar. But one important fact of our network of women is that one-third of them are widows. They're widows because they have lost their husbands, their first or primary source of providers, to the war that has been going on all of my lifetime, and I'm 35 years old. And these are women who are now forced to lead their families and provide for their children who are usually six or seven or sometimes eight and nine children to, to, to provide for. And yet a woman in a society where women are not valued and with the extreme level of um, you know, lack of skills that she has because nobody, her family did not invest in her, she was not being prepared as a child to lead a family of five or six when she became a widow as a result of war. So she is now earning an income for her children, and it is the widows in our program that are most likely pushing their children, especially young boys, to go to school to become educated rather than being sent abroad, uh, meaning sent abroad or sent across the border to become the next suicide bomber. All of our women who work with us are illiterate. And this is no surprise if you even take it a lot of, look at a lot of the women in Afghanistan. Our partnership with Global Good Partners has allowed us to provide literacy training for only 20 of our women. But I say only 20, not in the sense that we are devaluing the number 20, but it's the emphasis on the quality of 20 because these 20 women can change the future of their children, and the future of women in Kandahar. These women are getting daily literacy service um, from a teacher that we've hired who's in the production site full time. So she's there from morning until night, and she works with the women on their pace. So we have divided the women to about three groups, the beginners, those who absolutely know nothing, about literacy, then the medium, and then the, those, the younger ones, the more enthusiastic ones who don't have um, many children to take care of. So they're, they're reading faster, they're studying faster, so they, their pace has gotten uh, faster. So the teacher is able to um, address each group's needs separately. And Zia Jan, who's one of our 50-year-old tailor in the office, tells me when I asked her how she felt or how, what, what is her feeling about the class that she's attending or the, uh, the literacy training she's getting. And she says, quote, I'm not going to become a professor at age 50, but if I can read simple signs on the streets and sign my name when I'm asked to instead of using my thumb to do a thumbprint, that will, be, that will make me very happy. So the goal of these women are not, I mean, it's really, it's something we cannot relate to, but the simple understanding of reading a sign to make sure that that's a doctor's office or a shop or a clinic or just a street name, that in itself will empower women. 
With over 90% over 90% overall illiteracy in Afghanistan, this is over men and women, the narrative of Afghanistan today is that only of killing, destruction, corruption, and a country without a visible hope and a foreseeable hope. We at KT and Global Goods Partners believe that by empowering women financially and with providing the skill of literacy, we hope that we can begin to change that Afghan narrative. And, know, and we know we will. And we also know that the future of Afghanistan depends on its women. Good evening. I, I would like to say how delighted I am to be celebrating um, Phil Schultz and Monica Banks and the 25th year of the Writer Studio. I'm an admirer of Phil's poetry, and I also have the privilege of being his editor for his acclaimed memoir, My Dyslexia. I am equally delighted to be honoring Global Goods Partners and its founders, my two dear friends, Joan Schifrin and Catherine Shimoni. A decade ago on the beach in East Hampton and many conversations thereafter, I witnessed their passion and intensity as they began to develop the idea for global goods and have watched in awe over the many years since their unswerving dedication in realizing their dream of working with organizations to provide work and income to the many remarkable and deserving artisans in 20 countries in Asia, Africa, and the Americas and I'm proud to be their friend. Tonight I'm going to read one of the letters from, um, her name is Matilda, and she works with Kiege de las Boscas, a social enterprise that connects artisans in remote, impoverished areas of Guatemala with markets within the country and overseas. Most Kiej artisans are mothers with young children. Kiej enables them to generate income while working at home. I am from eastern Guatemala, but I live in Pastores, a small town near Antigua, approximately 30 kilometers from Guatemala City. I was born in a family without a father. I was seven years old when my father died. I am the seventh child among the nine children in the family. I was not able to go to primary school and married when I was 15 years old. Since then, I was on my own and disconnected from my family. My first husband was from the eastern part of Guatemala, where men are famous for being violent and abusive towards women. Looking back to all the changes in my life, I am glad that I was raised without anybody telling me what to do. I had to learn what was good and what was bad, and I'm grateful that no one can dominate me. I am very independent and determined. At age of 19, I decided to leave my first husband because I couldn't tolerate him anymore. <laughs> But then I realized I was pregnant. I was on my own and didn't know what to do. I decided to look for my family. I found my sister who then helped me while I was pregnant. I lived with her for four years during my pregnancy and when my son was small. When my son was eight years old, I found my current husband. Like me, he also went through many difficulties in life. We were both looking for a person to form a family together. Thus, in 1998, we came to this village where my husband was originally from. In the beginning, people looked down on me because I was an outsider. In 2000, the World Vision Group was here teaching women how to grow vegetables. I went to the group. I recognized the need in the community for a health worker, so I also took a first aid course and learn to administer vaccinations. The community recognized that they needed my services. In 2005, when the hurricane happened, I realized I had to do something for my community, for my family, and for myself, and that I could be very resourceful. 
Thus, I organized a support group for the hurricane flood with two other women. In 2006, a program called Growing Well was initiated by the former First Lady of Guatemala that provides training for women on how to improve their families. Then Kiej de los Boscas came into our community. They proposed to dream big and create a company to improve our lives, so five more women joined my group. We then started to work with the Kiej de los Boscas on crafts. I became the leader of the group and traveled back and forth to Guatemala City to learn the necessary skills. My husband was not very happy seeing me traveling to Guatemala City and work in addition to doing housework. Because the product orders were intermittent in the beginning, my husband always doubted its value. He thought I was doing it for fun. <laughs> Some things never change. <laughs> In 2009, when the order from Kiej increased, he asked me one day if he could come with me to Guatemala City to learn what I was doing. He came with me to the Kiej office and saw the check I received for my work. He said, is that what you've been paid? Yes, this is our money, I said. We had money for the house and for the children. We used the money to build more rooms for the house using brick walls and installed wood floors. The money he was giving me before my work with Kiej was insufficient to do this, and we were all pleased with this new opportunity. In 2010, my husband was diagnosed with cancer, lymphoma. We needed more money for his treatment. He wanted to learn more about what I do and understand how he could help. Now he helps me with my travels to Kiej de las Boscas office in Guatemala City. He assists with procuring the materials and distributing our products, going to the bank and handling accounting and payment to women in my group. We travel to the bank in Antigua by motorcycle, sometimes with 10,000 Kitzels, around $1,200. On a typical day, I wake up at 5 in the morning, make my bed, and make a simple breakfast for my family. Then I get my children ready for school, and then I begin to think about my work. I usually start working with bracelets, experiment with color and material for new designs, and work on finances. I prepare lunch for my family and then get my kids back to school after they eat. In the afternoon, sometimes I go to other women's homes or the community to check and see if there is anything they need from me. I also work on products and train my group to do the work. If there is a pending order from Kiej, I work on it for 100% of my time during the day. My daughter helps with the cooking, and I focus on filling the orders. But my work schedule depends on the time of year. Orders have varied widely between months. At night, I watch telenovelas or just continue to work on designs. The work I do has helped to pay for my children's education, especially my daughter. She can make the same kind of project, products I'm making. Her future is brighter now. I want both of my children to have a father, mother, and a good home. After my father died, my mother lost her mind. My husband's health concerns me greatly, but I will provide for my children no matter what happens. I want them to be professionals and to have opportunities I did not have. My daughter wants to pursue a social work career because she is influenced by my work. I believe that all women in the world are capable of doing anything we want, and in everything we do, we do with love. I value my work, and this work is the way to make my dreams come true. I have big dreams for my family, and the Kiej motto of Live Your Dream applies to all women in the group. The fact that women get together to work is not only for income, 
but also to share stories about our families, communities, and personal feelings. We are no longer isolated. Working together has become a healing process that makes a difference in our mood and in our daily life. I love to work and find myself becoming depressed if I am not working. And that is her letter. So I'm um, in honor of the craft and creation that we're honoring today with both the writer's studio and with the artisans. I'm going to just uh, to read you two poems, um, and they're both about the making of art and about poetry. And um, the first one is called Cathedral of Wonder. They peered into the hole in the broken stained glass of the cathedral, and the boy saw it was a sculptor's studio in the basement of the grand church, all dust and plaster and half-finished sculptures in abundance. I don't feel like myself anymore, he said. The boy was eight. He knew how to read, play music, calculate his times table. He had abandoned one set of heroes for other heroes. The biblical garden lush with autumn flower, the morning brash, brilliant, curling itself inside and around the open spaces within the close, the boy's eyes on fire as he glimpsed an interior world viewed through a broken window. Through the peephole, he watched the sculptor chisel into the body of the statue, witnessed the mysterious alignment of faith and vision turned out of stone. Her face is in pain, he said, unaware of suffering in pursuit of beauty. And uh, this next poem is called Myth of Creation. With nothing but a pencil and a blank sheet of thin skin paper, the empire forged itself without will or reason upon the dreamer, luring her toward reciprocation until the tip of her finger formed a callus, until word by word, sentence by sentence, sense by sensibility, found their own scurrilous logic. Trust me, said the voice, who seemed to be a second self, a shadow. There is no free will without pain. A touch against her skin signified the fragility of being. The elusive trees were her father's, books her teachers, her heroes were statues in the museum garden. She traveled through the city, its history etched in the brick of marble buildings, searched faces for meaning, though not one face struck her alike. Don't be afraid, the voice said, as if fear were another definition for happiness. And for one moment, the world revolved around her like a sea of shimmering stars, where she was the center of the universe, where she shut the door and no one dared enter, where she dreamt of lovers who would never want her, where the rain fell regardless. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um. Very glad to be with you for this double celebration. This letter is from Maritza, a knitter who works with Manuela Ramos, an NGO that provides human rights training to indigenous women artisans in some of the poorest regions of Peru. The organization's name, which is comparable to Jane Doe in the United States, pays homage to the millions of women who anonymously and selflessly contribute to the development of their communities. 
My name is Maritza Condori Chura, and I am 25 years old. I live in Centro Poblado de Colini in the Pomata district of Puno, Peru. I am writing to you because I would like you to know more about me and how I became an artisan knitter. I was brought up in a hilly region, and my brothers, sisters, and I looked after the cattle and the planting in my family's farm. I went to school but could not continue my education because my parents had no money. My friends who faced the same situation decided to go to Tacna or Agrequipa to work as maids, but I stayed here to achieve my goal of becoming an artisan. It was not easy to do this because no one taught me to knit when I was a young girl, and in my town women did not spin. Besides, due to my lack of experience, I gave birth to two girls when I was still very young. I had a very hard time, there was not enough money, and I faced several problems. One day in the Pomata Plaza, I saw some gringos buy miniature sweaters from the women in my town at a very good price. So I told myself, Maritza, you have to learn how to knit immediately. <laughs> the very next day, I signed up to be part of a group by Manuel Ramos, and that was four years ago. Thanks to everything I've learned, I think I know even more than professionals. I also grew as a person. My husband respects me now, and with the money I get from my knitting, I contribute to my home and can send my girls to school. To be a good artisan, the most important thing is perseverance. Some of my friends get bored. Others get upset when someone returns something they knit because it was not done correctly. As one gets orders, one learns. The more you knit, the more you learn, and you become more creative. I go out to the countryside to get inspiration, and after I come back, my knitting is prettier. I know that very soon I will become a true artisan, not only because I can knit the littlest mouse to the most complicated poncho, but also because I am training myself to produce and to coordinate orders which will be exported. Also in my group, I am respected, respected because of my leadership skills. I hope that someday you can come visit me here in Colini, so that you can get to know about my town's customs. We dance and enjoy a delicious charito. You'll have the opportunity to see with your own eyes how our hands produce bears and rabbits. But I especially would like you to come so that you may listen to our dreams. I do not wish to end this letter without thanking you for your support and the trust you have in all of us, and especially my group, the Association of Artisans Colini. Thank you. What a letter. In fact, it's sort of good for the poetry part of it, too. I mean, perseverance. <laughs> so I'm delighted also to read some poems to you uh, in honor of the 25th anniversary of the school and uh, your great achievement in surviving and thriving. And so I thought I'd begin by reading you two poems about poetry. This is called Branch Library. I wish I could find that skinny, long-beaked boy who perched in the branches of the old branch library. He spent the Sabbath flying between the wobbly stacks and the flimsy wooden tables on the second floor, pecking at nuts, nesting in broken spines, scratching notes under his own corner patch of sky. I'd give anything to find that birdie boy again, bursting out into the dusky blue afternoon with his satchel of scrawls and scribbles, radiating heat, singing with joy. And this is called Two Poetry. Don't desert me just because I stayed up last night watching The Lost Weekend. <laughs> I know I've spent too much time praising your naked body to strangers and gossiping about lovers you betrayed. I've stalked you in foreign cities and followed your far-flung movements, pretending I could describe you. Forgive me for getting jacked on coffee and obsessing over your features year after jittery year. I'm sorry for handing you a line and typing you on a screen but don't let me suffer in silence. 
Does anyone still invoke the muse, string a wooden lyre for Apollo, or try to saddle up Pegasus? Winged horse, heavenly god or goddess, indifferent entity, secret code, stored magic, pleasance and half wonder. Hell, I've loved you my entire life without even knowing what you are or how. Please help me to find you. And I just want to read you three other poems. This is about my biological father. It's called My Father's Front. My father wanted my sister and me to know things our mother wouldn't do in bed because she was frigid. I was eight years old. My sister, seven. So it was time for us to learn whores are the only real women because they're gentle with men. That's... Sorry. That's important for a man like me, he boasted, because I have a small penis. <laughs> I wonder what Freud would have thought about a man whose ego was all id. He said it was no big deal that he wanted to buy my stepbrother a Las Vegas hooker for his bar mitzvah, though my stepfather, my stepbrother refused, which annoyed our dad, who shrugged. You'll just have to get hard on your own. He would have made me the same offer, but he had missed my adolescence. It's your mother's fault, he told me later. There were certain things she wouldn't touch. I was floating in the deep end of the pool. If you keep talking about my mother in bed, I'm going to leave, I warned him. And soon afterward, I was flying home. That was our father's front, the troops he exposed in combat. And this is called Troubadour Song. It's in the style of the, 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 the Provencal troubadours who I'm just crazy about and who are sort of the foundation of modern European poetry. I woke this winter morning to the smell of the sea and hummed the song for nothing, how nothing came to me. I dreamed I mounted a horse along an empty beach where we galloped far away till I was out of reach. We trotted past the lighthouse abandoned on the dunes and paused by a small stable that was now in ruins. I woke this winter morning to the smell of the sea and made a song for nothing, how nothing came to me. We rode to the starkest edge of nowhere by the sea. The horse was all that remained of what I'd longed to be. We had somewhere deep to rest and nothing left to see. And so the two of us walked into the cemetery. I woke this winter morning to the smell of the sea and sang a song for nothing, how nothing came to me. And I'm just going to close with a short poem called The Widening Sky. I am so small walking on the beach at night under the widening sky. The wet sand quickens beneath my feet and the waves thunder against the shore. I am moving away from the boardwalk with its colorful streamers of people and the hotels with their blinking lights. The wind sighs for hundreds of miles. I am disappearing so far into the dark I have vanished from sight. I am a tiny seashell that has secretly drifted ashore and carries the sound of the ocean surging through its body. I am so small now no one can see me. How can I be filled with such a vast love? Thank you. Thank you and uh, good evening. Um, I'm very, very uh, happy and honored to be here tonight to celebrate Global Goods Partners uh, and the Writer's Studio, which is where I got my start as a writer uh, 20 years ago, um, which is why I thought that Phil had invited me tonight, but I think he forgot. Um, but <laughs> I actually, I very tentatively signed up for my first workshop ever um, 
I had just quit painting and I was kind of at loose ends. And I took uh, classes for two years at the Writer's Studio and I think I learned more in those two years uh, than I have any place else since. It was a great foundation, so thank you, Phil. Um, so I'm going to read uh, first uh, a letter from a woman artisan working with Destiny Reflection, a social enterprise in Calcutta, India, that provides sustainable livelihoods to former trafficked sex workers. I hail from a very small village in West Bengal's Nadia district. My father was extremely poor and supported the family as a daily laborer working in rented land. Since childhood, I used to help my father with his work. When I was around 13 or 14, I started working with a lady from our neighborhood, helping her make necklaces. Even though I worked very hard, I was paid extremely low, and the money I earned was hardly enough to sustain my family. And the lady told me that she had another job opportunity for me in Mumbai, where I would be paid well and hence that would solve the family's financial crisis. My father believed the lady and sent me to her. Later, I realized that she had sold me to a brothel in Mumbai, which is at least 2,000 kilometers away from my home, and the people spoke in a different language. I was put up with many young girls, some even younger than me. I still had no clue or idea of what they were going to do with me. The building was dark and full of hidden chambers where they used to hide the girls when there were police raids or maybe just to punish them. I noticed police raids were futile as most of the time the girls came back even after the rescue operation. I remember that I kept on crying for days. One of the inmate girls told me that crying won't help and that I would have to accept this life. I lost hope of being rescued because I noticed that the girls who got away kept coming back, which happens when the traffickers bribe the police. But one day I got rescued by a team of men who were from the criminal investigation department, after which I was put in a shelter home. I then had to fight my case in court and face the trauma of being diagnosed with HIV. I thought that I would have to spend my entire life in a shelter and I would die because of my disease. But my life has changed since I joined Destiny. I am an independent woman now. I have been able to move out of the shelter home to a woman's hostel. I still remember the faces of the little girls who used to be locked in the dark chambers during police raids and the torture and inhuman life of the brothels. They used to, make up, they used to put makeup on the girls and make them wear high heels so that the girls looked older. My only mission now is to help Destiny grow bigger and create work opportunity for many other girls like me so that they can start their life again. I have regained a positive outlook towards life and I am confident that I can overcome any problems. Uh, so now I'm going to read uh, a few excerpts from the first chapter of my novel, uh, The Buddha in the Attic. And the novel is about uh, young picture brides or mail order brides uh, who uh, sailed from Japan in the early 1900s to America to meet their future husbands. And uh, there's no main character. The, the entire book is told in the we voice, the first person plural. And the uh, title of the first chapter is Come Japanese. On the boat, we were mostly virgins. We had long black hair and flat white feet and we were not very tall. Some of us had eaten nothing but rice gruel as young girls and had slightly bowed legs. And some of us were only 14 years old and were still young girls ourselves. Some of us came from the city in more stylish city clothes. But many more of us came from the country and on the boat we wore the same old kimonos we'd been wearing for years. Faded hand-me-downs from our sisters that had been patched and re-dyed many times. Some of us came from the mountains and had never before seen the sea except for in pictures. And some of us were the daughters of fishermen who had been around the sea all our lives. 
Perhaps we had lost a brother or father to the sea or a fiancé. Perhaps someone we loved had jumped into the water one unhappy morning and simply swum away, and now it was time for us, too, to move on. On the boat, the first thing we did before deciding who we liked and didn't like, before telling each other which one of the islands we were from and why we were leaving, before even bothering to learn each other's names, was compare photographs of our husbands. They were handsome young men with dark eyes and full heads of hair and skin that was smooth and unblemished. Their chins were strong, their posture good, their noses were straight and high. They looked like our brothers and fathers back home, only better dressed in gray frock coats and fine western three-piece suits. Some of them were standing on sidewalks in front of wooden A-frame houses with white picket fences and neatly mowed lawns, and some were leaning in driveways against Model T Fords. Some were sitting in studios on stiff high back chairs with their hands neatly folded and staring straight into the camera as though they were ready to take on the world. All of them had promised to be there waiting for us in San Francisco when we sailed into port. On the boat, we slept down below in steerage where it was filthy and dim. Our beds were narrow metal racks stacked one on top of the other, and our mattresses were hard and thin and darkened with the stains of other journeys, other lives. Our pillows were stuffed with dried wheat hulls. Scraps of food littered the passageways between berths, and the floors were wet and slick. There was one porthole, and in the evening, after the hatch was closed, the darkness filled with whispers. Will it hurt? Bodies tossed and turned beneath the blankets. The sea rose and fell. The damp air stifled. At night, we dreamed of our husbands. We dreamed of new wooden sandals and endless bolts of indigo silk and of living one day in a house with a chimney. We dreamed we were lovely and tall. We dreamed we were back in the rice paddies, which we had so desperately wanted to escape. The rice paddy dreams were always nightmares. We dreamed of our older and prettier sisters who had been sold to the geisha houses by our fathers so that the rest of us might eat. And when we woke, we were gasping for air. For a second, I thought I was her. On the boat, we often stood on the deck for hours with the wind in our hair watching the other passengers go by. We saw turban Sikhs from the Punjab who were fleeing to Panama from their native land. We saw wealthy white Russians who were fleeing the revolution. We saw Chinese laborers from Hong Kong who were going to work in the cotton fields of Peru. We saw King Lee Ivanovich and his famous band of gypsies who owned a large cattle ranch in Mexico and were rumored to be the richest band of gypsies in the world. We saw a trio of sunburned German tourists and a handsome Spanish priest and a tall, ruddy Englishman named Charles who appeared at the railing every afternoon at quarter past three and walked several brisk lengths of the deck. Charles was traveling in first class and had dark green eyes and a sharp pointy nose and spoke perfect Japanese and was the first white person many of us had ever seen. He was a professor of foreign languages at the university in Osaka and had a Japanese wife and a child and had been sent to America many times and was endlessly patient with our questions. Was it true that Americans had a strong animal odor? Charles laughed and said, well, do I? And let us lean in close for a sniff. <laughs> and just how hairy were they? About as hairy as I am, Charles replied. And then he rolled up his sleeves to show us his arms, which were covered with dark brown hairs that made us shiver. 
And did they really grow hair on their chests? Charles blushed and said he could not show us his chest, and we blushed and explained that we had not asked him to. <laughs> and were there still savage tribes of Red Indians wandering all over the prairies? Charles told us that all the Red Indians had been taken away, and we breathed a sigh of relief. And was it true that the women in America did not have to kneel down before their husbands or cover their mouths when they laughed? Charles stared at a passing ship on the horizon and then sighed and said, sadly, yes. <laughs> and did the men and women there really dance cheek to cheek all night long? Only on Saturdays, Charles explained. And were the dance steps very difficult? Charles said they were easy and gave us a moonlit lesson on the foxtrot the following evening on the deck. Slow, slow, quick, quick. And was downtown San Francisco truly bigger than the Ginza? Why, of course. And were the houses in America really three times the size of our own? Indeed, they were. And did each house have a piano in the front parlor? Charles said it was more like every other house. And did he think we would be happy there? Charles took off his glasses and looked down at us with his lovely green eyes and said, oh yes, very. On the boat, we could not have known that, that when we first saw our husbands, we would have no idea who they were that the crowd of men in knit caps and shabby black coats waiting for us down below on the dock would bear no resemblance to the handsome young men in the photographs. That the photographs we had been sent were 20 years old. That the letters we had been written had been written to us by people other than our husbands, professional people with beautiful handwriting whose job it was to tell lies and win hearts that when we first heard our names being called out across the water, one of us would cover her eyes and turn away. I want to go home. But the rest of us would lower our heads and smooth down the skirts of our kimonos and walk down the gangplank and step out into the still warm day. This is America, we would say to ourselves. There is no need to worry, and we would be wrong. Thank you very much. This letter is from Sophie, an artisan with Friends International, an NGO in Phnom Penh that works with families of former street children and other high-risk youths providing skills, training, health care, primary education, counseling, and employment opportunities for parents. So here's the letter. I was born in Kandal province. Our family moved to Phnom Penh when I was 28 years old. I am now already 47 years old. My husband needed to migrate to Bangkok to work in the construction industry. Life became tough when he started his new life and left me with my four children. He left us when my youngest son was five years old. Now he is already 18. Because of family poverty, I needed to go to work in construction in Bangkok for some time also. I had to leave again when my daughter was seven months pregnant to work in a construction site in another city of Cambodia, Sihanoukville. My daughter got divorced back then. We were very unlucky. While I was away, I didn't make much money to send back home. But we had good neighbors. They shared food with my daughter because they saw she was pregnant. My neighbor is like God. Things got a lot better when I learned to make products to sell and support my family. 
I don't have much education. I love learning, but I finished my education at grade five. Poverty is a big challenge for my life. Now Cambodia is better. Our family is fine because we have an NGO that teaches us to work and make money. Roles for women were difficult in our community when I was growing up. Some women now can go to school and have a better life, but some still work as scavengers. Others work in factories. I hope that Friends International can help them to see a good future too. When I was very young, we had a lot of challenges. We were very poor and had no opportunity. Now our country is a bit better, but we still face difficult challenges like poverty and poor education. My own life is a lot different now that I'm working with Capital F Friends, Friends International. What is great is that I can stay with my beloved daughter and son and especially my little grandson. I don't have to go to work in another city in construction and leave them behind like before. We have food to eat and money to buy it. I am a one-parent family leader as a mom and also a dad for all my children. My second daughter has given me a grandson I love my grandson so much. He is three years old this March. He is the gift from Buddha. As a Cambodian woman, I follow Buddhism. I believe that Buddha is right. I understand that our lives were difficult in the past because we did bad things in the previous life. And after we pay for them, life will get better. After my grandson was born, we had good luck. I joined the Friends Home-Based Project and got training. My son also got vocational training. Our family improved and my daughter also works now. Through my work, I can earn enough money to support my grandson in school. I can also work at home to cook and look after my grandson while my daughter can go to work and my son can study in Ramdang restaurant, one of friends' restaurants in Phnom Penh. That sort of thing was on television a few nights ago. I don't know if you saw it. The Friends International in Phnom Penh and the working in restaurants. So this was very vivid to me when I got the letter to read tonight. When I am not working, I generally look after my grandson. I also do some laundry for the neighbor to generate income to support the family. I don't want to be too free. With the income we now make, we eat better and have better hygiene. In general, our health is very good. I have low heart rate and start forgetting a lot now but I think this is a normal illness for older women. You remember she said she's 47 (laughs) years old. Well, I guess that is old for her. My grandson is my aspiration. I want him to study, be great, and have good life, good future, and good job. I don't want him to have as difficult a life as I did. I want my son to have a good job get married and have a good family. I only hope that my daughter can meet a very honest man who loves her and my grandson. My dream is to be able to have my own house for the family. Before, we rented a small room for our family. Now, luckily, my sister and her family moved to Sihanoukville and we can stay in her small house. I just hope that I can save enough to buy a small piece of land and build a house for our family. The products we make for Friends International and the materials we use reflect our culture. 
The paperclip necklaces are made from snack packages that many people throw on the ground. In our village, scavengers collect plastic boxes, cans, or bottles. But I go out and collect snack packages or cigarette boxes. Sometimes the children help me. When I first began to collect them, the villagers laughed at me, but now they understand and they have stopped laughing. They appreciate the things I make from the snack packages. I am proud that this waste material can be transformed into a valuable product, and people from other countries see the value. My hard work is also of great value to me. These products are the work of hand, heart, and hope. We hope that you love them. The more support we get for the products, the more chance we have for a better future. I was very moved by that letter. It's, it's hard to read. It's better to read it to yourself. But it's very moving to me that the person comes through another language so, so deeply. So I'm going to read a couple of poems of my own and want to thank everybody for the evening. I guess I'm the last uh, reader. So thank you all very much for being here with us. This is called In Prison. In prison, without being accused, or reach your family, or have a family, you have conscience, heart trouble, asthma, manic depressive, we lost the baby, no meds, no one, no window, black water, nail-scratched walls, your pure face turned away, embarrassed, you who the earth was for. And I'll just read one other. There was so much, uh, it seemed to me there was so much parting in, in her letter, separation. So this is one about that. It's called Ghost Elephants. In the elephant field, tall green ghost elephants with your cargo of summer leaves. At night, I heard you breathing at the window. Don't you ever think I'm not crying since you're away from me? Don't ever think I went free? At first, the goodbye had a lilt to it, maybe just a couple of months but it was a beheading. Ghost elephant, reach down, cross me over. Thank you.